How much stuff is in your head right now? 12,000 years ago, here are all the things that you would have to think about in your day. Sharpening tools. Hunting. Gathering. Figuring out how to get a goat to follow you. In present day, it's this. Check the 50 notifications that came in last night from 30 different apps. Make sure the trial subscription that you signed up to last month isn't draining your bank account. Reschedule those three overlapping Zoom meetings that you have this week. Say happy birthday to three people that you haven't talked to in five years because social media guilt tripped you. Juggle those four projects that you said yes to while you're in a good mood. Pick one of the 80 million songs at your fingertips while you wait for the food that it took you an hour to pick. Eventually decide that you're actually going to watch a true crime documentary, so scroll through 100 of those. While you wait for your date that you met after sifting through 20,000 strangers on an app while laying in bed half watching some YouTube video where a bald Australian dude is trying to tell you about how overwhelming modern life is becoming. So, so much more. Historically speaking, you, me, all of us, we have every right to feel overwhelmed. Before we dive into why, just want to say a quick thank you to Shopify for sponsoring this video. More on them and why they're relevant later. And if you have been feeling overwhelmed lately, then well, firstly, you're not alone. But secondly, if I do my job correctly, you're watching the right video. Skylab was the first ever United Space Station. And in 1974, Skylab 4 was set to be the final mission to that station. Given that this was the last mission, NASA wanted to milk it. And so they overloaded the crew with every task imaginable. So who was this crew? Well, on board the rocket were three astronauts, Gerald Carr, Edward Gibson, and William Polk. While these guys were extremely trained and clever, none of them had been to space before, ever. This is what's known as an all-rookie crew, and it understandably comes with a couple of problems. As the rocket takes off, one of those problems comes up. William Pogue, the pilot, gets space sick, nauseous to the point of vomiting. But not to alarm anybody, he keeps this quiet. When it's found out by ground control, the crew gets reprimanded, to the point where this mistake was printed on the front page of the New York Times. Cue tension. So Skylab 4 gets to space, and the crew gets to work for 84 days. The missions before them had gone for 28 days, then 60 days, but now Skylab 4 was going to be up there for nearly three months. And on the seventh day, one of their three gyroscopes malfunctioned, which means they now had no backup if another breaks. To me, this feels like the equivalent of wearing a white shirt while eating spaghetti. You're not in trouble, but you're not far from it. Every day started with a long morning briefing via radio. Ground control would hit the crew with a series of complicated questions and demands. Then a list would be printed through the teleprinter. One morning, this list was so long that Edward Gibson measured it at 60 feet. After the meeting, the crew would then divide up the tasks and get to work. Some of these tasks were standard and expected. Others were standard, but came with a demand for increased effort. An example of this was the number of spacewalks the crew had to do was doubled from two to four. And then there were the last minute tasks. Remember how NASA wanted to get the most out of this final Skylab mission? NASA capitalized on this by throwing in a bunch of other stuff. The crew's workload now included a whole host of stuff for which they had no training. So naturally, the guys get 24 seven micromanagement. Meanwhile, all of this work was hardly being appreciated. Instead, Skylab 4 was constantly being compared to the previous Skylab astronauts. Skylab 3 were given the nickname the 150% crew because of how much additional work they got done. Meanwhile, Skylab 4 were the rookie crew with the vomiting pilot and the 60 foot to-do lists. And let's not underplay the context. I will say it once again, none of these guys had ever been to space, ever. This is an adjustment to everything. Sleeping, eating, using the bathroom, brushing your teeth, even just moving. Now add the fact that they also had a mandatory 90 minute daily workout while being weightless and it starts to stack up. And as many astronauts have noted, space isn't just the physical adjustment. There's the mental game too. Loneliness, cabin fever, homesickness, nausea, boredom, pressure, the genuine risk of death. Now, at media scrutiny and the fact that there is $12 billion riding on your every move. This, as you can imagine, is a huge recipe for overwhelm. One day, the crew misses their morning briefing. What happened next would change NASA forever. Cliffhanger. How that story ends later in the video. For now, let's talk about the nature of overwhelm itself, because the more we understand the concept, the richer the ending to that story is gonna be. So this project, this little research project on the topic of overwhelm, why am I making it, man? Well, the reason that I'm making this is, dun da da da, to scratch my own itch. See, I've been stretched incredibly thin in the past couple of months. It's been really, really hard. I'll give you a quick rundown. First things first, my wife Felicity and I, we became parents to our amazing little daughter. 
it has been this magical, emotional, and exhausting bliss. My animation studio started a new project called Struthiverse. I took on one too many illustration projects, although I am proud of them, this one particularly. My friend Bryce and I wrote a live comedy special, which we've been touring around theatres in Australia. And on top of this, I got this YouTube channel, my podcast, and any spare time that I'm not playing with my daughter, I am writing my second book. Can you see the bags, baby? Can you see them? Good Lord. <laughs> In short, I have been really, really overwhelmed. So I started this research project, this video that you're watching right here. And when I came across this experiment, that is when it all started to click. This is Bubba Shiv. He's a marketing professor and an expert in something called neuroeconomics, a field of study that combines economics with psychology. So Bubba Shiv, right? As an experiment, he gathered a bunch of people, put them in one room, and then he made them remember a number. Then they had to walk down the hall, enter another room, and recite that number. Some people were given a seven-digit number, while other people were given a two-digit number. Now here's the cool part, right? When they were walking down that hallway, unbeknownst to them, somebody would interrupt them. They didn't know that this was part of the experiment, but what happened was a woman would come up to them with a bunch of snacks and she had two snacks on option she'd say do you want some chocolate cake or do you want some fruit pretty simple decision however what happened was that the people who only had to remember the two digit number were twice as likely to pick the fruit whereas the people who had to remember all of those seven digits they tended to go for the chocolate cake what does this mean to explain his findings Baba Shiv referenced this theory that the brain is divided into two systems you have the rational or the prefrontal cortex and the emotional the limbic system their rational brain was busy. It was trying to remember the seven digit numbers. And so while it was in use, it didn't have enough resources to allocate to whether or not it should pick the healthier decision. Without the rational brain to remind you to take the healthy option, the emotional one just said, chocolate freaking cake. Let's go. And as it turns out, this emotional response is incredibly common in people who are overwhelmed and stressed. I don't know if this resonates with you, but it definitely does with me. Every time I am overwhelmed, I do tend to react to things more emotionally and less rationally. And obviously this is incredibly important as the decisions that you make in your everyday life will become your life. So if you are overwhelmed and constantly taking the short-term gratification option, eventually you'll build that life. This reminds me of a quote, and I've quoted this a lot on the channel, but I'll do it again. It's from the Olympic weightlifter Jersey Gregorek. Hard choices, easy life. Easy choices, hard life. The hard choice makes for an easier life in the long run. But what's really cool about Bubba Shiv's research is making these hard decisions, it's not just a matter of discipline. It's also a matter of not being completely overloaded in your brain. Which brings us to the big question, how do you do it? How do you get less overwhelmed? Sounds pretty good, man, but how? All right, that method after a quick word from today's sponsor. Shopify is an all-in-one, easy-to-use online commerce platform. Anyone can use it, regardless of your technical ability to start, grow, and maintain, and scale a business, baby. If you've ever had that little thought in your head that goes, hmm, I could sell products online, and then the other thought that goes, no, you couldn't. Well, today might be the day that you do it. Shopify, most of us know, lets you sell online, but it also lets you sell in person and on social media. They got plugins, resources, and support from your first sale to full scale. I've got a link in the description if that is something that you are curious about. And they support more entrepreneurs than anybody else in the world. Millions and millions of people in 175 different countries, including your boy. Struthless.com, the place where I have all of my apparel, art, prints, all of that sort of stuff. That is built on Shopify. Actually, fun fact, when I switched to Shopify, my sales pretty much doubled. Link in description, Shopify, baby. Alrighty, back to the video. The Sharp Axe Method. I've called this method the sharp axe method because of that Abraham Lincoln quote, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four sharpening the axe. This quote for me is about doing the right work up front, preparing correctly so you can save yourself time in the long run. And that's what this method is gonna be about. And just before we get into it, a quick reminder, I'm not an expert, I'm just a dude with a YouTube channel and this is just my system. If it doesn't work for you, doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. So, you know, cherry pick the stuff that does resonate, ditch the stuff that doesn't. I recommend using multiple sources to build your own system. And with that in mind, let's sharpen our axes. Step one, environment. So the first step when I am overwhelmed is just to take a bit of control over my environment and make it a little bit more ordered. This means physically, it's like cleaning my desk, clearing all that sort of stuff, like cleaning the kitchen, I don't know, just generally cleaning. I do this digitally as well. So on my laptop, what it means is exiting every single program. I'll clean up my desktop and if I'm really in the mood, I will move a bunch of big files onto a hard drive. On my phone, it's deleting social media because that is the mess <laughs> that's on there. It's usually that. Or even just putting my phone itself somewhere else like a drawer. Now, while we're cleaning up our physical and digital environment, there's also this mental environment that we can just help before doing the rest of the sharp axe method. Basically throwing a couple of like breathing exercises at the wall. So things like box breathing, which is in for three, hold for three, 
out for three, hold for three. Another thing that helps here is naming five things you can hear, see, touch, smell, and taste. What we're trying to do here in this first step is address the immediate concerns. The things that are within our reach, in our environment that are distracting us. The notifications on the phone, the plates that have been left out, the fact that we haven't really gotten back in touch with our body. So once we've done this step, it's time for step two. Brain dump, yes, the brain dump. If you've read my book, you'll know that I am a massive fan of the brain dump. What this involves is getting all of your thoughts that are up here out onto the page. There are lots of ways to brain dump, but for this sharp axe method, what I'll do is I'll just write out a stream of consciousness and just kind of get the top layer thoughts onto the page. And then I'll follow this up with a list, a list of everything that I might need to do at some point ever. Just get all of those potentially pressing tasks in front of me. It doesn't need to be in order, just needs to be out. Step three, categorize those things. So that list that has come at the end of our brain dump is gonna act like a to-do list. But at the moment, it's a massive mess. So what we're gonna do here is categorize it. There are a couple of cool ways to do this, like the Eisenhower matrix. This is where you plot all your tasks based on their importance and their urgency. Everything in this quadrant you do, everything here you schedule, everything here you delegate, and everything here you delete. So that's one way to categorize. A second way might be, uh, there's this cool Tim Ferriss question where he asks, what one thing, if done would make everything else on this list easier. And then a third, more simple way to categorize is just lookalike groups. So this is where you cluster your lists based on things that require either similar energy or similar resources. What I like about it is it sort of plans for minimal context switching. So you can just always kind of stay in one particular headspace for as long as possible. But yeah, categorizing tasks, it's kind of like building Lego. I don't know if you've built Lego recently, but it's so much easier to build if you have all of your colors separated because you're like, oh, that's where the yellow one is. Oh, that's where the gray one is. Boom, we've built a yellow gray boat, I guess. So now we know what's important, what's urgent, what's pressing, what we actually have to do, what was in our head that might've been stressing us out. It's time to figure out how long all of this is gonna take. Step four. Schedule. This is obviously quite a straightforward action. Scheduling in its core form is looking at all of these tasks that are competing for your attention and sticking them on a calendar in a doable way. So when I'm doing this, when I'm taking my list to the calendar, there's a couple of rules that I follow. First rule, if it takes less than two minutes, I don't schedule it, I just do it immediately. The second rule is I plan visually on a calendar. I don't try to write it out like a list, I just need the boxes in front of me. Rule three, I put in the dates that can't be moved first. So things like deadlines, birthdays, holidays, I'll put it in first first and then I'll build everything around it. Rule four, however long I think something is gonna take, I double it. I use this one just to offset the fact that I seem to always overestimate how quickly I'll be able to do something, always. Rule five, put the most important tasks in the calendar first to the least important, regardless of how much I wanna do either. Also, when I'm doing this, I do try to put an emphasis on creating large uninterrupted blocks of time. Rule six, get ultra specific when writing what needs to be done. Rule seven, if it looks impossible, just ask what would it look like if it were easy, then plan for that. Rule eight, plan for average me, not me at my best. If I make a schedule, assuming that I'm gonna be 100% every single day, I will fall short of that schedule 10 times out of 10. But if I include reality into my schedule and I know that usually one day a week, I'm just kind of like off, just have like this off day where I can't get anything done. If I factor that in into my schedule, then things start to look achievable. Rule nine, where possible, focus on doing one task to its completion. Rule 10, a good plan is a flexible plan. Be prepared to change everything. So those are my rules for a schedule. And just to recap on where we are in the sharp axe method. So we started with our environment. That's all looking nicer. We got the brain dump. We organized the brain dump. Now it's in a calendar. And now we get to step five, communicate. So I know what work I have to do, but before I start any of that, I communicate to my stakeholders. So let's say there's an illustration and I'm a week late on it. What I'll do is I'll call up the client and I'll say, hey, I'm not gonna have that illustration done until Thursday. But Campbell, the schedule said Wednesday. So by telling the stakeholder exactly when they'll get something, their frustrations are a little bit quelled for the moment and now they have a day that they are expecting the illustration on. But by the time Wednesday rolls around, they're pleasantly surprised. I'm not a completely overwhelmed mess, yay. Or if, for example, you have friends and family relying on you for something, for me, I always wanna let them know sooner rather than later that I am overwhelmed. All right, step six. Just do it. Yes, it is that annoyingly true Nike slogan. This step is basically about following your schedule until you're a bit less overwhelmed. It's about getting through it by doing the work. If you are stuck in this stage, I've made a bunch of videos about how to just do stuff, so I'll put them in the description too. But yeah, what this step six is about is about actually chopping down that tree. And the only way to chop is to chop. So that's the sharp axe method. Fairly straightforward, probably makes sense intuitively. Ultimately, this is 
I guess it's about reality, right? <laughs> in an ideal world, we wouldn't have to work. In an ideal world, we wouldn't get overwhelmed. But this world ain't ideal. And we are working and we are overwhelmed because there's rent, there's food, there's everything. And all of it's just hitting your head every single day. And meanwhile, you're thinking, dude, I didn't even have to be born. We're just floating on a rock. We're monkeys. There's a freaking sun in the sky. And also, you just happen to be alive in the largest communication revolution known to humans. It's not ideal. However, it does leave one big question unanswered. Why did this happen in the first place? Why did we get overwhelmed? I mean, up until now, we've mostly been talking about curing overwhelm, but there's also prevention. A final thing that I like to do once I've overcome a particular period of overwhelm is sort of look back and ask, why? <laughs> and those answers come in all shapes and sizes. Sometimes I find it hard to say no, I'm just a people pleaser and I'll say yes in the moment because it's way easier than being like, actually, I have too much on. I'll just find the time later. This is something that we can work on by practicing saying no. If you do struggle with saying no, I'll link a podcast that might help you in the description. Sometimes I get overwhelmed because I'll be using work as advice or I give myself a really ridiculous expectation that I need to do something by some particular moment. And other times it's because I'm avoiding something. I don't know, there's a lot of reasons why we might get overwhelmed and this is so personal so it's sort of hard to really provide the tools for introspection here but one particular technique that I like is asking why and then when you've got that answer ask why again eventually you might find your answer but if you don't chill too. And on that note of introspection, the final thing that I do want to say about this is being drained, being exhausted, being overwhelmed, being pushed to your limit. It's not always a bad thing. Don't get me wrong. It feels awful. I would not spend 100% of my time there, but it can be a way to know your own personal limits and it can be a way to grow. There's this beautiful lyric from the band Eve Klein Blue where the singer says, if you're ever coming down or if you ever take too much, remember that's much better than never ever getting enough. Being pushed to your limit sucks, but it can also be an amazing teacher. And it's also sometimes better than the alternative, not getting pushed at all. So on that note, let's revisit that story that kicked us off. So remember those astronauts? The ones who got given way too many tasks every single day at these long, arduous briefings? The first half of that story, it ended with them missing a meeting. On a $12 billion mission, this is a pretty big deal. The media saw the astronauts miss the meeting and they painted it as some sort of space strike. But the reality was just a bit more simple. They were overwhelmed. It was an honest mistake. They were genuinely in this exhausting haze that they just missed the meeting. But as it would be, missing this meeting actually turned out to be a good thing because it let ground control know that they were pushing the astronauts too far. This led to a different type of meeting, a very important and kind of historic one. Ground control and the crew decided to air their grievances, just talk about everything, get it all out on the table. And there were some good results. Ground control agreed to stop micromanaging the astronauts, just give them a bit more wiggle room. The amount of information that the crew needed to digest every day, it was just decreased. And all of those last minute tasks that NASA was so hell bent on, gone. So now the workload is manageable. Instead of spreading themselves thin, the crew was now focused on doing a few things really well. And given that it was the last ever Skylab mission, these changes did have their skeptics. Well, turns out these changes were great, baby. Hell yeah. So the first change was super noticeable. Morale was up. The astronauts were happy. Hmm. But the big change that NASA didn't see coming, productivity was up too. Like seriously up. To the point where a $12 billion investment starts to look like a good idea. In addition to those four spacewalks, the astronauts also performed a whole bunch of experiments. They photographed the Earth from space. They photographed Comet Kahootek. And they took 75,000 new telescopic images of the sun, including the first ever from space recording of the birth of a solar flare. In fact, by the time the crew returned to Earth, their productivity record was even better than that 150% crew. Despite the rocky and over overwhelming start, once they sorted everything out, the mission was a huge, huge success. By taking stock of what was going on, by auditing what was and wasn't important, by ditching a bunch of stuff, by giving themselves a little bit more freedom and a bit more happiness, they were able to take one of the most overwhelming situations that any human has been in ever and make it work. So, I don't know, maybe I can too. Yoo! <laughs> I'm not very good at inspiring stories. Or even inspiring quotes, but you know who is? Seneca the Younger. So we're going to finish with his words because I feel like this is what NASA learned. And now I think this might be what I've learned. The mind should not be kept continuously at the same pitch of concentration, but given amusing diversions. Our minds must relax. They will rise better and keener after a rest. 
Thank you so much for watching. I do hope that you are feeling less overwhelmed than you did when you started watching. Big shout out Shopify and also I have turned on members. What I'm trying to do there is build like a Q&A community so that way we can go a little bit more specific on stuff. And if you like this vibe, stick around, subscribe. And if you really like this vibe, check out my book. It's about mental clarity. It's called Your Head is a Houseboat. And uh, other than that, have a beautiful day. Catch ya.